paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Come with us on a musical journey through some of the most magnificent places on Earth. Great towns and cities of Europe, steeped in history and beauty, and resounding with the stories and music of the world's greatest composers. Debussy, Rossini, Chopin, Elgar, Rachmaninoff. Just some of the greats in our classical destinations. Hello, I'm Simon Callow. Welcome back to Classical Destinations, where we travel through the landscapes and the lives of the great composers. This is Worcestershire, in England's rolling west country, and it's as English as the English countryside can get. It's scenery like this that's been inspiring artists for centuries. And when English classical music, largely dormant since Handel, was revived in the second half of the 19th century, this is where it began. For nearly a hundred years from the middle of the 19th century, Britain ruled the world, or at least that very substantial part of the map, which was painted red. It did not, however, rule the world of music. The Germans rather pityingly described Britain as das Land ohne Musik, the land without music. All that was about to change, however, with the emergence of the first great British composer since the 18th century. This is Worcester Cathedral. Building began in 1084, not quite 20 years after the Norman Conquest. And only a few miles from here was born the man who transformed the standing of English music in the world. England's greatest romantic composer, perhaps the greatest English composer since Handel, Edward Elgar. Here in the shadow of the Malvern Hills, in Lower Broadheath, a little rustic idyll, Elgar was born in this cottage, originally called The Furs, and now a museum in his honor. Born in 1857, Edward Elgar was one of seven children. His father, William, was the organist at St. George's Roman Catholic Church, but made his living tuning pianos. The young Elgar was a sensitive and dreamy child who immediately connected with the rolling scenery around him. This is where Elgar was actually born. It's now a landing um, on the first floor of, of this a charming house, a very simple, modest place. He was the fourth child to be born to Father William Harvey and his mother Anne. The father was trained in music publishing and sold instruments and had a shop in town. Worcester and his mother had been a barmaid. So they're very, very simple people. It's an absolutely charming house, now part of the museum and filled with Elgar memorabilia, very evocative stuff. In fact, the Elgars left here when he was two. They went to live in Worcester, living over the shop, the music shop. But he must have been very fond of the place because it was his dying wish that the house should be bought back and turned into a museum. 
and this work was undertaken by his daughter, Caris. And here you can see the various implements of his trade, uh, his music paper and his, his pens and so on. And here, um, a letter that he had transcribed from one that Mozart wrote to his father, obviously very significant for him. The passions, whether violent or otherwise, must never be expressed to disgust. And music, even in the most terrific situation, never give pain to the ear, but ever delight it and remain music. Well, those sentiments could hardly be better expressed than in this piece, Salut d'Amour, which was his great breakthrough piece. It was just over 30 when he wrote it, and he's dedicated it à Caris, which is not, in fact, his daughter, who hadn't yet been born, but his wife, it's a contraction of his wife's two first names, Caroline and Alice, Caris. Well, Salut de Mort has always been a special piece for me. I, I think Elgar has been a composer that I grew up with, and I, I've always known the piece, and I've always known the serenade for strings. And so it's kind of music that is in my soul and in my blood. So when I'm performing it, I just actually, don't, I try not to think too much about it. I just play it, and it comes from the heart. And I mean, you know, he wrote it as an engagement present for his wife. So it's full of love and warm feelings. And of course, his love of the English countryside. Times were tough, and so for practical reasons, in 1859, the Elgar family moved into the flat above the music shop. Leaving his beloved countryside was distressing for Elgar, but there were compensations. For a small boy who loved music, and whose musical talents were already very evident, living above a shop full of instruments was even better than living above a toy shop. Elgar spent every moment he could, even playing truant from school, to experiment with playing the instrument and studying the sheet music. Elgar might have been a little surprised to discover what replaced the family music store, Elgar Brothers, where, as a boy, he studied scores, played instruments, and learned about music, world music. He might have been even more surprised to find out what music is playing at the moment. There was little spare money for formal music lessons, so Elgar decided he would teach himself, listening to new pieces and then immediately playing them by ear. He even had to buy his own copies of scores, which were highly prized and meticulously studied. Despite his great talents and abilities, Edward Elgar struggled to make a living. He taught both the piano and the violin and sought paid work wherever he could, including, for a while, as the musical director at a lunatic asylum, organizing a motley bunch of amateur players into an orchestra to entertain the patients. Although the Elgars would worship at the local Catholic church on Sundays, Edward would run down to play the organ at the Anglican Cathedral after mass. The Elgars were Roman Catholics. Nonetheless, Elgar and his father played often on this organ. Elgar loved it, and he loved the cathedral deeply, and for it and its organ, he wrote his organ sonata. Elgar's life and music pivot around two very important events. 
The first was his marriage in 1889 to Caroline Alice Roberts, the daughter of a retired major general and from aristocratic stock. Nine years older than he was, Alice was one of Elgar's piano students, and she believed passionately and wholeheartedly in his musical talents. From Alice, Elgar not only gained the confidence to launch his career, but also immensely valuable connections in the upper echelons of English society. The struggling composer from a humble background was finally ready to take classical music stage by storm. The second great event in Elgar's life was that sort of event which transforms a composer from being respected, admired, and indeed popular into being a national figure. That moment came one Wednesday night in October 1901. At the famous promenade concerts, the proms, the audience stood as one and cheered raucously as the last notes of the pomp and circumstance march number one died away. The conductor was even compelled to play the piece three times. As it happens, Elgar himself wasn't there, but from this point, the ripples of his popularity and fame spread rapidly. Elgar knew he had a winner in the theme of the trio section of his first Pomp and Circumstance march. I've got a tune that will knock them, he told a friend. Knock them flat. But even the rapturous reception of the proms was nothing to what happened when the music was subsequently combined with words by Arthur Benson and called Land of Hope and Glory. When war broke out in 1914, the words took on an even greater patriotic significance. Although publicly very much the patriotic Englishman, privately Elgar became increasingly distressed as the death tolls on the battlefields of World War I rose relentlessly. He continued to write stirring nationalistic music to encourage his countrymen. But by the end of the war, he had grown to dislike very much what had happened to his knockout tune. In March of 1917, in the third bitter year of the First World War, Elgar conducted here in Worcester Cathedral a performance of his lament for the fallen. This is the baton that he used to conduct, and this is the score from which he worked. There is music in the midst of desolation and a glory that shines upon our tears. There's no doubt he believed fervently in the British Empire, but his idealistic view of countries cooperating peacefully and on equal terms was dramatically at odds with what had just been witnessed across Europe. In search of solace, Elgar returned to Sussex, and immediately the beauty of his surroundings inspired more contemplative music, the violin sonata, the string quartet, and the piano quintet. The trees are singing my music, Elgar once wrote, or have I sung theirs? Whatever Elgar's later misgivings, Britain has remained steadfastly in love with Land of Hope and Glory. A century on, it's still a much anticipated part of the last night of the proms, but with both world wars now a distant memory, the day's performances are a lot more light-hearted. The Royal Albert Hall is filled with waving flags and Union Jack-clad revelers who are enjoying the music for exactly what it is, a knockout tune. And the dominating empire has become a congenial commonwealth much more in keeping with Elgar's ideals of mutual cooperation and peaceful coexistence. Shortly after his death, Elgar's music fell rapidly out of fashion. The young Benjamin Britten, who was 20, and already a talented composer himself when Elgar died, wrote in his diary at the time that he found the music dull and was known to turn off the radio whenever an Elgar piece was broadcast. He changed his mind though and mellowed much towards the composer, making famous recordings of the dream of Gerontius and the introduction of Allegro for strings. Britain was born in 1913 and like Elgar was hugely influenced by the place where he was born, 
and spent his formative years. England's Suffolk coast, with its hardy fishing villages tenaciously battling the easterly elements year in and year out, resonates through much of his music. Britain was constantly drawn back to the landscape of his youth. In the mid-1930s, he converted an old mill in the village of Snape, not very far from the coast he loved so much. By now, he had found a partner in both life and music, the tenor Peter Pears, and the two would remain together until Britain's death. In the summer of 1947, Britain and Pears moved to a house in the centre of the coastal village of Alderborough, whose shingled beach and rugged North Sea inspired and sustained Britain for many years. The themes of the sea and its inherent dangers are visited time and again, most dramatically in Britain's 1945 opera, Peter Grimes, a work of immense strength and intensity in the best traditions of the Italian style, but also distinctively English. Appearing as it did just at the end of the Second World War, Peter Grimes and its extraordinary confidence and brilliance heralded a new era for British music. But equally, it was a new era for opera in general. Britain's operas are the most performed of all post-war operas across the world. Yeah, I think Britain is a very underrated composer, actually. I think his operas are incredible. Uh, the Simple Symphony is a, is a very early work of his, so uh, you know it's, it's all something that we all played when we were at school. So when approaching Britain, yeah, I think one has to hold him in high regard. I think he's a fantastic composer. In 1957, Britain had moved to the Red House, a few miles from the Suffolk coast. By this time, he had composed some of his greatest works, The Rape of Lucretia, Albert Herring, The Turn of the Screw, and perhaps the most powerful of them all, Billy Budd, a tragic tale of a good-hearted sailor who goes staunchly to his death after being falsely accused of mutiny. In the opera world, Budd is unique in having no female voices at all. His final masterpiece, Death in Venice, had its premiere in 1973. Today, the Red House is the home of the Britain Piers Foundation, which is part museum, part educational facility. Britain, the child prodigy whom some claim never really grew up, was committed to making classical music, including opera, more accessible to children, and wrote many pieces specifically for them, the best known being The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. Benjamin Britten's affinity with the sea is celebrated by a hauntingly beautiful sculpture set dramatically on the beach at Alderman, where it's constantly besieged by the tides and gales which are so often depicted in his music. Around the edge of the shell is pierced a line from Peter Grimes. I hear those voices that will not be drowned. Britain's own voice fell silent in the early hours of December the 4th, 1976, dying peacefully in the arms of Peter Piers. Not long before his death, Britain was made a life peer, the first, and indeed so far the only, British composer to achieve this honour. It was a recognition of his unique contribution to classical music in Britain. Very different, of course, from that of Elgar's, but equal to it. On April the 7th, 1920, Edward Elgar's beloved Alice died. With her, his inspiration seemed to die too. Now his great supporter and encourager was gone. He lost direction and struggled to write music, although he never stopped trying. After his daughter, Caris, married in 1922, Elgar was entirely on his own, and a year later he returned to his other great love, Worcestershire, to spend the rest of his life in the company of his dogs, Marco and Mina. Once again, 
immersed in the countryside of his childhood. As a boy and as a man, all his life, Elgar wandered through these hills, and from these hills, he drew his music. He said to an interviewer late in his life, my idea is that music is in the air. It is all around us. The world is full of music, and you have simply to snatch all you require. Elgar's final years were spent at Marl Bank, a house on a hill he had had his eye on for years because of its glorious views across to Worcester, the Anglican Cathedral, the River Severn, and the Morven Hills. Everything he held dear, in fact. Here he felt sufficiently enlivened to begin composing again, and a symphony, which would have been his third, began to take shape, and there were plans for an opera. In 1933, persistent back pain was diagnosed as a malignant tumour. Elgar requested that he be allowed to see out his days at Marl Bank, where, although bedridden, he could still look out on the things that had been both the foundation and the inspiration for his music. After the performance of For the Fallen, Elgar donated a copy of the score of his first great masterpiece, The Dream of Garantius, to the cathedral, inscribing it, making a nearly 60 years love of my own cathedral, Edward Elgar. Behind me is the window which was erected to the memory of Elgar when he died in 1934. It depicts the story of Garantius. We see the dying man crying out to heaven, Jesu Maria, I am near to death, and thou, thou art calling me. I know it now. The Malvern Hills were with Elgar to the very end. On his deathbed, he whistled the opening sequence of the cello concerto to one of his friends. And he said to him, if ever you're in the Malvern Hills and you hear that, don't be frightened. It's only me. Edward Elgar died laden with honors in 1934 in his home in Worcester, in Marl Bank. And he came to his final resting place in this beautiful country churchyard, in St. Woolston's Catholic Church, Little Morven, next to his beloved wife, eventually to be joined by his much-loved daughter. An exquisitely modest end for the man who sounded the pomp and the circumstance, the composer laureate of empire. There are, in a sense, two Elgars. One is a popular composer of exquisite salon pieces and stirring anthems and patriotic marches which carried a nation through dark times. The other is the sensitive boy who grew into an even more sensitive man and wrote music full of keenly felt emotion and richly drawn imagery. The Enigma Variations, the Great Violin Concerto, Falstaff, the Two Symphonies, and the Dream of Garantius, to name just a few. The self-taught musician from a working-class background who became the greatest English composer of the late Romantic period, just as his wife Alice had always believed he would, succeeded spectacularly in his lifelong desire to write music which moved people. We'll be leaving England now and travelling to France and the great city of Paris. But later in the series, we'll be travelling the short distance to the neighbouring county of Gloucestershire, where, just a couple of decades later, two of Elgar's great fellow British composers, Gustav Holst and Rafe Vaughan Williams, were born. See you then. Goodbye. Simon Callow.